Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Pauline. Um, so this is a great chance for us to exchange ideas and uh, look at the uh, issues and uh, from a little bigger perspective. Um, so uh, we uh, we had the, the nice talks uh, this morning and mostly um, exoskeletons and the issues. Uh, but uh, in the afternoon we have uh, um, more talks uh, and the general uh, wearable robots. So. Uh, regardless of the uh, particular fault, but uh, uh, we are dealing with the, the systems where the robots are very close to the humans. So uh, as the title of this uh, workshop, uh, uh, you know, human robot symbiosis is really critical issues in many ways, and we can extend to these issues uh, because the, uh, our case and robots are closest to the humans, uh, not the robot sitting on the floor. So uh, many issues. Pauline has sent me a few uh, uh, questions, uh, possible uh, topics that we discuss uh, at this time. Uh, the one is the learning, um, yeah, robot should learn the, what the uh, humans are doing, and they also human adapts to that. Uh, so both sides are actually you know, having a learning and abilities. Uh, it could be the case that uh, we're chasing the moving target and uh, the house, the, uh, this is a kind of classical program, but I know, uh, 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 in the view of new uh, exoskeletons and other devices, are there any new issues that we have to uh, address? Well, sensors and actuators, and we got the, uh, the nice uh, um, 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 presentation by uh, Robert on the uh, uh, pseudo or cozy um, direct drive uh, actuators, uh, which plays very important roles uh, in this area. But also the sensors, uh, more, I know Pauline uh, said that the uh, uh, we deal with only uh, kinematics and the uh, EMG. Um, are there any uh, you know, major innovations in, in that? Uh, or you know, our side of big needs uh, to push the, you know, uh, our technology forward? What, uh, what sort of emerging uh, you know, sensor technology that we should look at? And the machine learning, uh, we had to uh, collect many data. So in our case, uh, uh, collecting data, the biological systems are uh, particularly difficult and very expensive and the cost uh, also having some risk. So how we can actually mitigate that issues are, you know, the data position. And uh, those are a little bit big, big ones. And this acceptance of technologies. And I heard that the wedding of the uh, robot is the last uh, thing so that people can accept, uh, uh, but we're pushing this. Uh, maybe a passive uh, exoskeleton is very practical uh, this stage. But I know overall, what is the uh, uh, technology acceptance of the issues and that we have to deal with? So we have many of the issues and also more modern issues and so forth. So, so I don't know where to start, uh, but uh, um, any comments or any um, you know, good questions um, to any speakers, uh, not necessarily on the one particular problem uh, or, or presentation, but uh, something a little bigger perspective would be appreciated. So um, uh, we, I see my screen. I see uh, uh, Mate, Robert, and how how young, um, and uh, 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 Reynolds. Um, so uh, also I see uh, Wen Long. Uh, can anyone start uh, and raising any uh, any any points? Hi, Professor Asata, maybe I start. Yeah, go ahead. How are you on? Uh, I think the difficulties that we all encounter is um, validation, especially if you are involving patients. The, the validation, uh, the clinical validation of our design and any sense in the control methodology uh, is really, really, very challenging. Um, you need a lot of data and uh, conducting any patient trial uh, is not just costly, but sometimes it's a luxury because of the availability of the chances to do experiments with patients. Yeah, so I don't know how to solve that problem in the long term. It's still very difficult. Yeah. Is there any way to uh, collect the you know data or usage uh, you know through a cloud or a network uh, you know so after releasing some <laughs> machines you know. We can collect the vast number of data. <laughs> um, this may be actually applicable only uh, the later stage. Uh, 
but I know we need some technology to, to uh, <laughs> you know, push the uh, case forward, right? Uh, we we might have a little bit of a of a chicken and egg problem there, right? Because to get lots of data, we need lots of these machines out in the in the wild. But to get lots of machines in the wild, they need to be functional. And in order to be functional, we need to be able to train. We need we need the data. So we're 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 going in circles. And I mean, to me, this you know what you are saying, how long that that also you know rings true not just from a validation perspective but also you know machine learning was mentioned earlier and for us it's a big part of what we do and lack of data is critical for training any you know intent inferral algorithm that we might use you know it's interesting these days the age of deep learning you know it's the big deal and everybody's like you know my deep network is deeper than any other deep network and the question is, I mean, is there any use, and that's it, is there any use for machine learning that's not deep neural networks and are all the problems solved? And the, you know, one, one place where you need traditional machine learning methods is in data poor environments. And what we're doing here is an incredibly data poor environment uh, compared to what, what deep learning typically needs. So, and you know, we have no simulators. A lot of people who need to train deep neural networks manage to get the data with, with simulators. There's no simulator that will generate good data for you know, an exoskeleton, what it's like to actually be on a person assisting a person. So I think to me, that's a, a massively rich area of research for the next couple of years of getting advances in learning in these very, very data poor environments that we have. In my experience with the, you know, uh, musculoskeletal model, and you know, for instance, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, anybody that the reporting uh, mentioned, uh, turns out pretty good though. Um, you know, we have to use it very, very cautiously, carefully. <laughs> um, but I know if you, we can combine this, some of the verification experiments. Uh, um, yeah, we can use that. Uh, that that is our kind of asset, you know. Not, not the poking in the dark, uh, you know, <laughs> collecting the, just the data, but uh, uh, you know, we could be uh, guided, uh, you know, by that kind of a model. And then we we wish to have a kind of a, um, uh, a kind of shared, the you know, environment, the tools. Uh, uh, for us to uh, use the uh, kind of unified uh, uh, you know, simulator uh, environment uh, so we can benchmark things and against it, uh, although it's a long, long way to go. But I know, uh, you know, Mata, you, you, you will raise the uh, you know, important issue. So we had to go to uh, you know, a model and then uh, model, uh, you know, it's getting available and we, as well as we use it carefully, uh, it should be right. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, um, uh, as the Professor Asada mentioned, like uh, the simulator, like uh, anybody, is not uh, perfect, but it certainly gives some kind of like, uh, insight to know a little bit more information. Uh, another piece of uh, maybe tool that I can uh, have our community is uh, data. I think, uh, for example, um, Aaron Young from Georgia Tech, they published a paper about the human data. I think uh, maybe people don't quite appreciate this before they publish this kind of like, a data type paper. But after getting this paper, uh, those data, we found that it's super useful. So in particular during pandemic, we can run a lot of experiments, right? Using those shared data. And I think uh, maybe um, um, my lab and also many other labs that we can share more data, most able-bodied data, even able-bodied data, I think is very, very useful. Uh, also like uh, people with disability, those people's data are also very, very useful. Maybe uh, looking forward, we can share more data. I think uh, make everyone's life easier. Yeah. Yeah, I think I just want to add on what uh, what Hal uh, said. Uh, I think for us to sort of share data, maybe it's very helpful for us to develop some sort of common standard. Um, let's say for um, let's say for healthy participants, especially, right? So uh, maybe uh, we we really want to set. For example, you know, a, a protocol for you know putting the markers in the mocap system. What is the speed for treadmill walking? And for um, 
you know, overground walking, what, what should be sort of the activities that, that we do. Um, another thing that I want to mention is, so for patient testing, I, I think um, one challenge that we have been experiencing is the uh, significant variance um, of how uh, sort of patients react to the robot that we're, we are, we're providing. And I think that's when we really need to sort of talk with uh, domain experts uh, in uh, physical therapy rehab um, you know, and really get their inside and then start working with them. And I think I'm quite sure you guys all read the news um, about the recent uh, uh, development of Google Health, right? I think this is really something that we as a community also need to, you know, uh, you know, really reach out to the domain experts and really integrate their knowledge into our um, system design. Yeah, I just want to add, um, so I want to second what Hal mentioned about the um, Aaron Young's data set and also what Wen Long was saying about, you know, what kind of data do we need, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that, that my group's really been interested in is continuous variations of activities. So like, you know, walking could be done at um, any walking speed on any inclination, right? And so continuously varying those parameters provide really useful data for the different types of scenarios you might encounter with an exoskeleton. Um, also, I think non-rhythmic activities um, are really important to uh, sit, sit to stand. Um, Aaron Young's group, I, I believe, is also adding a bunch of non-rhythmic non activities to, to their open source data set. So I think this stuff is going to be really, really useful. Um, my group has a data set coming out probably within, within weeks um, on, on continuous variations of stairs. So different stair inclinations and um, walk, uh, walking or ramps and, and different speeds and sit to stand as well. So, so yeah, I think this is a really great trend that we're seeing in the, in the community that we have these great data sets um, becoming available. <clears throat> okay, um, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, sorry, uh, I have a, um, it's like a, bit, a bit tangent, but I have a question about the um, security of the data while telemedicine. So um, I was trying to collaborate with a PT uh, during pandemic um, using telecommunication stuff. Um, the concern was how to protect the uh, well, subject, uh, the patient data, and then how could we address? Like I think if we go to patient, we need to think about data security something. Um, um, I think it's really tangent, but like, do we have any thought about the data um, sharing or moving forward, like having open source data about patient data? Or it's really I, tangent? I, yeah, so it, I, yeah, it, it is pretty well regulated uh, uh, when we apply to IRB, uh, right? Uh, we have to uh, follow uh, pretty you know, stringent uh, regulations. And, so um, yeah, as far as we do that, you know, uh, not uh, disclosing any, you know, ID. Uh, we must be careful about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I like to have a more open uh, openness in the data. And this is actually uh, common good, right? In promoting common good, um, you know, we had to deal with the risk part there well, but uh, you know, this is something we have to push. Yeah, and then actually in the, uh, you know era of the pandemic, <laughs> this is so critical. And just, just to complement, I think I, I totally join, uh, I think Wenlong was saying that um, one of the big issues, is, I mean, there is the, the sharing and data availability, but there is also to have some kind of, of common standard or at least common description so that um, it's kind of easy to reuse the data because from experience, sometimes, I mean, you have more and more data sets available, but um, sometimes you realize that uh, you're, you're missing some information or it's very different from the way, I mean, you would have used the data and then it just makes it, um, it I mean, kind of very hard to, to reuse the data because uh, uh, there is no, no real common standard about that, which, uh, which probably might be missing there. Okay, well, we are running out of time, but I know, let, let me just say, uh, you know, push up another, another um, aspect. Uh, that's a kind of a technology components and technologies in particular. We heard that the you know, new type of uh, direct drive, uh, semi direct drive uh, actuators. Um, uh, are we solving the problem or you know, still a long way to go? Uh, where uh, do we stand? 
uh, our Lord is a human. The human is pretty heavy, <laughs> and then and and, and very much you know uh, uh, sensitive, and we have to bear load. The store it must be compliant, right? <laughs> so that, that's a heck of a, actually a challenge. And, and where are we? And then uh, surely you know we see a, a new technology coming out, but uh, you know uh, update us key things, and they're going to wearable. So um, yeah. you know what's your view? Yeah, I think uh, Professor Asada, you have been doing the, uh, the the motor technology more than 30 years ago. I think uh, uh, we are kind of like uh, revisit your uh, uh, original uh, seminal research uh, question. I think uh, certainly like uh, Bobby has done a lot of uh, great work in terms of actuator. Uh, I think uh, um, maybe, but, but we are still kind of like uh, um, using the T motor, just kind of like a motor design for drones. I think it's not a still uh, maybe the best uh, ideal for the locomotion, no matter for variable or lack of the locomotion. I think uh, maybe there's still some space there uh, to optimize their design because we don't need uh, those high speed as uh, like uh, drones. So I think uh, there's still some space, but also some other soft actuators. Um, maybe there's some um, kind of like a, a alternative solution, but generally they are kind of like a two, um, uh, the, the, the fourth output is too small. So I think, uh, both uh, new motor, uh, optimized new motor, and also some new soft actuator have some promise, but we need to work on those two areas to make that really, really tailored for our community, yeah. Okay, uh, we have just one minute to go, but uh, how about the sensors? You know, do we need to uh, stay with uh, just the kinematics and, and then uh, uh, EMG? <laughs> Any uh, uh, also and uh, you know what sort of new needs and then um, you know emerging technologies are coming up. The first one's easy, absolutely, positively yeah. not. We need more. <laughs> EMG is so you know there's so much variation from person to person, and then depending on the condition, the underlying condition, EMG might be affected, especially if there's you know a, a stroke, for example. There's neural changes. So I would love to see a lot more, but what is coming around the bend? I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody else has uh, has some insights. Oh. I I, I uh, uh, you know I, I know that the uh, kind of optical sensors, which is to replace the EMG signals, and so you can put it uh, on top of a shirt, but still you can get to some EMG like <laughs> you know muscle activities, but uh, you know as bodies a. Uh, I know, and depending on the many, many factors, but there must be something, uh, you know, going beyond the EMG, although EMG is actually getting better, but uh, surely, you know, we should look at the uh, other stuff to monitor the uh, you know, muscle activities, and, I guess. I, I, I also it, want to point out that we still struggle to have reliable um, pressure insoles for mm -hmm. contact detection. <laughs> like, <laughs> the common problem, and it's ridiculous that it hasn't been solved yet, you know, I mean, in, in a prosthetic leg, I can put a really high quality load cell in, in the pylon and it's no problem. But for an exoskeleton, you know, when you have a little insole, it's hard. Yeah, the insole never works. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, Professor Hillhurst lab has some like a, a magnetic a beast uh, embedded in, inside a human body. Right, right, so that's right. a probably in the sensor robotics. And uh, yeah, I think that could be a cool solution, but um, we need to see how reliable and, and if there are uh, interference with the uh, environment, yeah. Okay, so thank you for your input. Uh, you know, it's 11.01, so we had to close the session, but I know uh, the areas we are working on uh, is very much, uh, you know, they're challenging. And, you know, we are based on the real needs. <laughs> you know, this is really, you know, um, you know, you know um, needs driven. Uh, at the same time, it's very scientific, uh, issue to driven and it provides lots of the challenges and which actually create the new technologies and actuators and sensors and the modeling it's a very rich area so we can expand it and all together thank you for your participation so we'll continue the next session